Uh, welcome here. If you're new with us, I'm one of the pastors here at Anchor. My name is Luke. Glad to have you here this morning. Uh, we are in the book of Esther. So if you have a Bible, open up to Esther chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the back of your pews. If you're not comfortable using a Bible, the words will be on the screen behind me. But I would highly encourage, not quite beg, but highly encourage you to open up God's Word with us this morning as we go through Esther chapter 2. Uh, we are in a series in the book of Esther, and this is our second week in it. And so if you're new this morning with us, you might feel a little bit behind in where we're going. And, and if you're going to come back, we'd encourage you to go to our website and listen to last week's sermon so that you kind of have an understanding of what the book of Esther is about and where it's going. Uh, before we dive into the text this morning, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God to speak to us. All right, let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you so much uh, for the sunshine, for the beautiful morning we have. Uh, God, we thank you that we could gather as your people and declare praises to you, God. You are so good to us. You are just so wonderful. You are worthy of every single ounce of praise we can offer. This morning, I pray, God, as we open up your word, as we look at Esther chapter 2, that you would speak to us. Um, God, this is a, a dark chapter in the book of Esther. It's one of... of um, compromise. It's one of abuse. It's one of uh, just darkness all around. And yet through it, God, you are present and you are working. God, we pray this morning as we look at this chapter that you would speak to us. You would give us an understanding of, of who you are and how you work and, and just really compromise situations. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. When it comes to the, the book of Esther, when it comes to the story of Esther, my guess is that if you grew up in the church like me, you probably know the story. Uh, you, you've probably heard the story in Sunday school or you maybe even read it at one point in your life. And because of that, you're, you're most likely familiar with the story of Esther. You, you know how the story goes. You know that Esther is this woman who becomes queen. She becomes queen at just the right moment so she can save her people from the evil uh, men in the, in the kingdom of Persia who want to wipe out all the Jews. You know the story ends with a victory over these evil men in Persia. You know that story. You're familiar with it. When we're familiar with biblical stories, it's a good thing. I'm glad you're familiar with it if you are. I'm glad you know your, your Bible history, your, your biblical literature is up there. I'm glad about that. But there's a danger that comes with that. When we, when we know scripture, when we know stories, especially stories in the Old Testament, like the story of Esther, when we know them, what can happen is we just kind of assume we know what happens throughout the whole entire story. We can approach the text with kind of rose-colored glasses. And whenever we do that, our familiarity can become dangerous to us. We can begin to miss things that we actually need to see. Think about it this way, all right? Let's say you missed the Riders game on Friday, all right? Maybe you, you didn't watch it or you're behind, you're doing something else that was way more important than watching the Riders lose, but you missed it, so you, you recorded it on TV. And as you're recording it, or you sit down to watch it after you record it, and as you're, you're watching it, your friend texts you and you're like, your friend's like, man, I cannot believe the Riders blew it again. And you're like, how could you not believe it? It's the writers. <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to happen. But, but your friend ruins it for you. They, he lets you know that the writers lost and it wasn't even close. But you still want to watch the game. And so you watch it at like one and a half speed or you fast forward through most of it, missing all the plays that you normally, if you're watching it in real time, would be dramatic plays for you. You'd want to see, was that actually pass interference? Did that person actually make the catch? You'd, you'd want to see those plays, but because you know the outcome of the game, because you know the Riders lost to Winnipeg, you just don't really care. You fast forward and you miss all the fine details. That, that's how we can approach the scriptures, especially stories like Esther. We know how it ends, so let's just fast forward and get to the end. Let's just kind of get through it. Whenever we approach Scripture that way, we always miss out. And so as we come to Esther chapter 2, Esther chapter 2 is a very familiar chapter in the story of Esther. So it's a, a chapter that, that we, we've probably heard at some point. If you watch VeggieTales, you probably saw some weird messed up version of it. I'm sorry. But as you come to Esther chapter 2, if you just kind of assume you know what happens, you will actually miss out on what God has for us in this chapter. So before we dive into it, I just need to clarify some things about Esther chapter 2 for us this morning, all right? Esther chapter 2 is not the Bible's version of the Cinderella story. It is the complete opposite. 
This is not about some young, beautiful girl who has nothing going for her, going to the palace and the king falling in love with her and magically her life is changed forever. That is not at all what is happening in Esther chapter two. This is not the biblical Cinderella story. It's far from it. Second, this is not Mordecai entering his cousin into a Persia's Got Talent contest, all right? This is not Esther going into some beauty pageant. Not even close. Esther is not going to perform her skills and talents before the king, hoping to impress him. This is the complete opposite of that. This is Esther being forcefully removed from her family, taken to a a place where her one job is to please the king. And that's a very sanitized version. That's an R-rated statement, all right, adults? You get what I'm saying? And pleasing the king is an R-rated statement. This is a chapter where the king is not trying to see what kind of talents out there in, in the country or the nation he presides, presides over. This is a chapter where a king uses his power to abuse, to abuse the women under his care and protection. Esther chapter 2 is not Mordecai thinking, I know how to save my people. I'll put my cousin into a place of power and make her become queen and then everything will work out. Mordecai has no idea what's in store for his people. Mordecai has no forethought in thinking if Esther becomes queen, it'll be good for us. This is Mordecai actually compromising himself and allowing his cousin Esther to be put in a position where she will be used and abused for the king's sake. Esther chapter two is incredibly dark. It's incredibly gross. It's, it's the worst of the worst. It's a chapter that reflects actually our culture and our cultural context today of abuse of power, of of men using women for their own desires and pleasures. It's a chapter that's marked by God's people compromising their faith for the sake uh, of their own safety. It's a chapter full of actions that do not line up with God's desires. And yet in the darkness of Esther chapter two, we see that God does not discard Esther or Mordecai. As Esther and Mordecai fail to honor God and all they do, God doesn't kick them to the curb. He doesn't remove them from the story. No, even in their unfaithfulness, God graciously works through the darkness of the second chapter to see his plans and his purpose move forward. This is a chapter that you and I desperately need to know for our own lives, Anchor Church. You see, you and I desperately need this chapter because we need to be reminded of God's faithfulness to us. We need to be reminded that in our lives, as we are unfaithful to God, he graciously is faithful to us. As we are unfaithful to God, he doesn't kick us to the curb, but he graciously works through the darkness in our lives and our circumstances, working out his plans and purposes. It's a good chapter for us to know. It's a good chapter for us to become familiar with again today. So that being said, if you have your Bible, Esther chapter two this morning, we're we're gonna read most of the chapter, but not the whole chapter. We're gonna kind of skim and go through some of the important parts. And then we're gonna look at two big things we have to see from this chapter, okay? Okay. Esther chapter two, verse one. After these things, all right, chapter one, if you guys were here last week, the king has this drunken party. He's showing off all his amazingness, his power, his privilege. And in his dark drunkenness, he decides to get his wife to come out and show off her beauty with only her crown on. All right, and she refuses and he fires her. He goes, full Donald Trump, you're fired, right? She is out as queen. All right, this is after that. When the anger, of, the anger of King Ahasuerus has abated, he remembered Vashti and what she has done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king and let the king appoint offices, our officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa of the citadel under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the woman. Let their cosmetics be given to them let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And guess what? This pleased the king. 
Surprise, surprise. And he did so. Let's just stop there, all right? So again, last week, king, drunken choice, gets rid of Vashti. Here in chapter two, all right, this is taking place some, sometime uh, between one and four years after chapter one, all right? This could be one year after, it could be three years after, but between one and four years after chapter one, the king's sitting there in his throne room and he's going full emo, right? He is just so sad that he got rid of his queen. The language here helps us understand this. The decision that he made wasn't really his heart's decision. This isn't what he wanted to have happen to Vashti. Vashti was beautiful. He loved her. And yet in his drunkenness, he made a bad decision. And so he's sad. He's depressed. It's not going well. His buddies around him see that the king is sad and moping around the castle. And they're like, we know what would cheer the king up. King, we got a great idea for you. Let's round up all the beautiful young women from your kingdom. Remember his kingdoms from India to Sudan, all right? Big kingdom. Lots of young girls, lots of pretty young girls, King. How about you sleep with each one and see which one you like the most? And then you pick your next wife. This pleased the King. Surprise, surprise. Look at verse five with me. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, son of Jer, son of Shemil, son of Kish, a Benjamite. All right, hold on to that. That's important next week, but we'll, we'll come back to that next week who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives. Drop down to verse seven. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had, be- had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. We'll, we'll pause there. All right, here's Mordecai and Esther. This is the first time we meet them in the story of the book of Esther. And what we learn is they're both Jews. Their, their families were taken when, when the, the kingdoms were invaded by Babylon, by Nebuchadnezzar, and they were exiled to Babylon. If you remember the book of Daniel, we preached through that about a year and a half, maybe almost two years ago. That's the story of, of what happened to Mordecai and Esther's family. They were taken from uh, the promised land to Babylon, and they were brought there. And Mordecai and Esther are still there. For some reason, they're still there. The the kings released the people to go back to Jerusalem, but Mordecai's family and Esther's family stayed. And what we we learn is that they are exiles. And that's important for us to know. This, This land, Susa of the citadel, this is not their home. They do not fit into this kingdom. They are Jewish people. They're God's people here. And that means they would be uh, on the outside looking in. They, They wouldn't fit in. Though the culture would be against them, not for them. It's important for us to know. Look at verse eight with me. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put into custody of Haggai, who had charge of the woman. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor, And he quickly provided her with cosmetics, her portion of the food, and with seven choice young women from the king's palace, and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. That's really important for us to see. We'll stop there. What was interesting in our text is is Mordecai would have known what was going to happen to Esther. As his decree goes out, he, he knows that Esther is at the king's disposal to be used and abused by the king. What we don't read about in our text is, is Mordecai seeking God's protection for them. We don't read about Mordecai trying to hide Esther back from the king's men. We see them freely go out. In fact, the only word of caution Mordecai gives to Esther as she leaves to go and be used and abused by the king is don't let the king know or anyone else know that you're Jewish. Keep it a secret. Keep it a secret. What happens? Look at verse uh, 15 real quick. When Esther, or when the turn came for Esther, all right, so she's into the, the castle. She goes there to see the king. Verse 16, and when Esther had taken to, or when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the 10th year of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women. She won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. 
Then the king gave a great feast for all the officials and the servants, and it was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes. What a nice guy, eh? I got a new wife, no taxes for you guys. And on top of that, look what he did. He re- gave remission of taxes to all the provinces and gave gifts with a royal generosity. He's happy again. The, the chapter two starts with him depressed and sad. He, he lost his beautiful wife. It ends with him finding a new wife and he is happy again. He's giving out gifts. He's throwing parties. He's back to himself. What's, what's really interesting here is Esther, she is given a pep talk by uh, Haggai, the the king's servant, Haggai gives Esther the the best technique to please the king. All right, that's a rated R comment there. Esther listens to this man. She goes to the castle and she pleases the king the most. She becomes queen. This is a a messed up story, the easiest way to put it. But but through the story, there's two big things I want to take away this morning. Two big things. We'll spend the remainder of our time looking at these two things. Number one, the first thing we need to see from our text this morning is there is a tension that comes with identifying as God's people. There is a tension that comes with identifying as God's people. Esther finds herself taken into custody, into the palace. And what's the one piece of advice Mordecai gives her? Look at verse 10 again with me. Really important. Esther had not made known her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. She is not to be identify herself with the people of God. In fact, this is such an important command. It comes up again in verse 20. We didn't go there, but it comes up again in verse 20. That Esther is told not to review her, her Jewishness. Not to, review, or not to let others know that she is with God's people. And the reason is, is what we're going to see later on in the book of Esther, is there is a danger to be known and associated with the people of God. What we'll see next week is that the people of God in exile were not well liked. That in fact, there is people in Persia who want to kill all the Jews, all the people of God. There was a danger with being identified with the people of God. And with that danger came attention. Do I identify with God's people and risk my life? Or do I hide my identity and just go with the flow of the kingdom? Esther, what does she choose? At the advice of Mordecai, she chooses to hide her identity, to go with the flow of the kingdom, with the the people, with the empire. It's interesting. Esther knows this tension. It's a tension that you and I also know. This part of the story is something that we can very well relate with. We understand that there's a tension in today's culture to be identified with the people of God. In our culture today, to come out and say, yes, I follow God. Jesus is my savior. There there creates a, a danger for us and a tension for us in our world today. We live in a cultural moment where if you actually confess orthodox Christian belief, what we just went through through the Apostles' Creed, it will put you at a place of tension in our culture. We we probably feel this the most during this month of June. This is a time where we experience tension. To come out and say, I hold to a biblical sexual ethic. To come out and say, I hold to a biblical view of life. To come out and say, I hold to a biblical understanding that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for my sins and is the only way to be made right with God. Whenever you confess those things, whenever you hold those things and you are public about those things, it will put you in tension with our culture today. Listen, at one point in the lot too far distant past, to, to be identified with God's people just meant you were weird. When I was in high school, you know, it, it was okay to be a follower of Jesus. You're just a weird Christian guy. But no one thought anything worse of you besides just being weird. You're like the Ned Flanders of high school, all right? And then as, as time has gone forward, we became kind of a rock in culture shoe. We became uncomfortable. We were annoying a little bit and weird. But now listen, Anchor Church, we are the bad guys of culture. To identify with God's people doesn't just make you weird doesn't make you just annoying. You are now the bad guys in culture. You're the rebels. You're the rebels. Why? Well, because we're the bad guys or because we associate with God, with his people, because we have a confession of Jesus as Lord and that affects all of our lives, 
we will now be known as the bigots, as the haters, as the people who are harmful to society. Steve McAlpine said this in his book, uh, Becoming the Bad Guys. Good title. He said this, we, um, we are being offered a rival gospel. We being culture. Culture is being offered a rival gospel. A narrative that seeks that first seeks to expose the Christian gospel as bad news and then replace it with a much needed good news. The, the gospel of Jesus today is not good news, which is ironic. Gospel means good news. We proclaim the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. That good news is now evil news. It's bad news to our world around us. The, the gospel of our current culture is if you just look inside yourself and see what desires you have, whatever's inside of you that wants to come out, if you embrace that and live that out, you will save yourself. That's the gospel that our culture preaches. The gospel of Jesus says you must die to yourself. You must come and die. It's a rival gospel. And our culture looks at the gospel of Jesus and says it's evil, it's wicked, and those who confess and believe it are hateful. The bad guys of culture. So Anchor, Anchor Church, we are the bad guys. We, we understand the tension that Esther felt in this moment. This is becoming very real. Uh, just this last fall, you might have heard this story. There is a, a, a CEO in Australia. I know how much you guys like Australian rules football. Uh, you guys cheer for it all the time. It's amazing. I'm so impressed at your cultural understanding of Australia. But Australian ru rules football is like the NFL of Australia. All right, it's a big thing there. And a, a man got appointed to become CEO of the Melbourne Club in Melbourne, Australia. And he was CEO for a whole 24 hours. Uh, before this appointment to CEO of uh, the Melbourne Australian Rules football team, he was the CEO of the biggest bank in Australia, very well-respected businessman. Uh, and as it was announced that he becomes CEO of this football's club, football club, sorry, uh, protests began to happen immediately. And they happened because he went to a, a Christian church, much like ours. It's a church plant, an Acts 29 church plant, who held an orthodox belief about who Jesus is and what that means for our lives in every aspect. And because he went to this church, calls were made for him to be fired immediately. 24 hours after taking this job, probably a dream job of his, he resigned. And in his resignation, he said this, my personal Christian faith is not tolerated or permitted in the public square. We're, we're the bad guys. We're the bad guys. The question that we have to ask this morning as the bad guys, as we navigate this tension of no longer being welcomed in our culture, in our society, no matter how loving or winsome or beautiful we are as a church, the question we have to ask is how can we navigate it and not compromise our faith? Esther, as she felt the tension, Mordecai, as they felt the tension, they compromised. Instead of living for God, they, they chose the route of least resistance and just went with the kingdom. How can we, as we face attention, not compromise our faith? Now, this could be a whole sermon series in itself, all right? So I'm not going to do that to you. Mick paid me money to make sure I'm done before 12 or before 11 o'clock. So uh, he's in kids' church today, so he doesn't want to be there forever. So I'll just give you one big reason why or what we can do to uh, help us navigate this tension. If we want to walk in this tension— and, uh, and not compromise our faith, we need to develop a big view of God. A big view of God. One of the most important things we can do is develop this big view of God. What, what does that actually mean? Most of you are like, I have a big view of God. <laughs> what, do, what do you mean by that? It, it's this idea of, of asking whose opinion matters most. Who's, whose opinion carries the most weight in your life? Another way of saying this, the, the way the Bible talks about it, is the fear of God. The fear of God is not like being scared of God. It's, it's having this reverence and awe for who God is and what he's done. The question is, whose opinion matters most in your life? So maybe a good example is this. Let's say this past weekend, I went to the farmer's market and I was walking around the vendors, you know, eating my, my donuts or whatever, coffee. And as I'm walking around, some guy comes up to me and he's like, hey, are you Luke at Lamaki? And I'm like, yeah, I think so, <laughs> maybe. And he's like, you're a pastor, aren't you? Yeah. You're the pastor at Anchor Church. I am. Have you, have you been there? Like, have you come? No, but I hate you. And your church is awful. And you need to resign as a pastor. You need to quit right now because you're an awful pastor. And just walked away. Now, the joke would be on him because I already resigned, right? Like, so it's kind of like, 
sucker. <laughs> but, but in that moment, right, it'd be like, it'd be like, whoa, like, what's this guy? Like, what does he know that I'm missing out on? Like, what, what's going on here? I, I would go home, and the first person I talked to would be my wife, right? Bailey, like, here's this weird encounter I had at the farmer's market. This guy said this about me, told me I need to quit. Like, I'm an awful pastor. Like, what, what is going on? Like, should I listen to him? What's going on? And hopefully in that moment, my wife would be like, well, you know what? He was wrong. <laughs> you're, you're a great pastor. Like, your church loves you. You're doing a good job. And I, who, whose opinion would I listen to in that moment? Would I listen to a crazy guy from the farmer's market or listen to my wife's? It'd be my wife's, right? She, her opinion carries way more weight in my life because I know she loves me. I know she cares for me. She knows me more, more and more than anyone else in this world. And so her, her words matter. Now, if she told me you're an awful pastor, you need to quit, I'd probably be done, right? Like it'd be game over, no more. But, but her opinion matters. And so I would listen to what she says and follow her advice. When it, when it comes to our, our cultural moment, the question is whose opinion matters more in your life? Whose opinion carries more weight in your life, Anchor Church? Is it, is it the God who created all things, who's all powerful, who spoke this world into existence, who, who holds everything together by his words? So the God who, who loves you, not just that he create all things and knows all things, but actually loves and pursues you, who sacrificed himself on the cross so that you could be made right with him, who doesn't give up and walk out on you when you screw up, but continually loves and pursues you. Does that God's opinion hold weight in your life? Or is it your coworker, your neighbor, your family member, the cultural commentary you see online? Who, whose opinion holds weight in your life? Now listen, if you have a, a small a small view of God, if you have a small God in your life, you ain't, you ain't imagining that, that tension very well. The second you're put in a situation where that tension's firm and it's hard, you're, you're going to compromise. You're going to go the way of Esther and Mordecai. But, but if you have a big view of God, you're going to say, you know what matters most in my life is, is not what you think or what you believe. It, it, what matters most in my life is honoring God. His, his words are true. His ways are true. So Anchor Church, we need to work here and now to develop a big view of God. And one of the best ways to do that is just to explore the depths of the gospel. In the gospel, we see who God is clearly. We see the all-powerful God who pursues and loves us, who sacrifices himself for us. And as we explore those depths and as we come to know that God more and more, he grows in his bigness. We see him clearly and we stand in awe and reverence of him. That's why the gospel is so important to us here at Anchor Church. That's why we sing it. That's why we preach it. That's why we take communion every week because we need to encounter the gospel again and again and again because as we do, we encounter God himself. We encounter who he is and what he's like and he grows big in our lives. So Anchor Church, the first thing we need to see here is there's a tension there's a tension when it comes to identifying with God's people. It's a tension that you and I have to get comfortable with because listen, you and I, we're the bad guys. We're the bad guys. We're the bad guys, all right? Number two, the second thing we see here in our text that we have, to, we have to look at and explore. God works through those who don't deserve it. God works through those who don't deserve it. This week uh, and last week as I read Esther chapter two, so I explored this text I kept thinking about the book of Daniel. We, like I said, we preached the book of Daniel. Uh, and in some ways, these, these two books are very similar. And in other ways, they're completely different. If you were with us to the book of Daniel, you would remember that Daniel was in exile. Him and his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were exiles to Babylon. And as they went to Babylon, they found themselves in a culture where they were on the outside looking in. They were under pressure to uh, adapt the Babylonian culture, to worship Babylonian gods, to do and live as Babylonians do and live. And as they faced that pressure, their response was one of, we're not going to compromise, no matter what. We're not going to compromise. And so Daniel and his buddies, they, they did not eat the food the king offered. Daniel and his buddies, they did not worship the gods of, of Babylon. Daniel and his buddies did not stop observing and, and pursuing God, no matter what the cost was in front of them. 
Esther and Mordecai, they're, they're part of, a, of the people of God in exile still. And they're, they're faced with the exact same pressures. Are they going to eat the food of the, of the kingdom? Or are they going to honor God? Are they going to follow the ways of the kingdom? Or are they going to honor God? And yet as Esther and Mordecai come again and again to these challenges, the, the complete opposite thing happens. They, they compromise. They compromise. Now, I don't want to pick on them because I cannot imagine the tension and the dangers that they faced. Esther and Mordecai, if Esther didn't go, they, I'm guessing they would have faced death. I mean, both of them. And so there, there's no need to look down on them because you and I are in the same situation. We probably would follow in the shoes of Esther and Mordecai. We probably would have compromised. And so as I read the story of chapter two and I compare it to Daniel chapter one and the whole book of Daniel in that essence, I keep thinking, man, like how is God going to use Esther and Mordecai? Because in, in Daniel, what we see is as Daniel is, and his friends are faithful to God, God blesses and works through them. He promotes them and they have places of influence in the kingdom. No matter what they do, it seems like God is at work in them to move them forward. And yet in Esther, as Esther compromises, as she and Mordecai go the wrong way, as they do not remain faithful to God, I keep wondering like, how is God going to work in the situation? Like reading this text, you would expect Esther to kind of fail, right? She won't actually make it, but there's another woman who is faithful to God and does the right things and says no to the king, right? She, she's going to remain pure until her wedding night. Doesn't happen though. Doesn't happen. I, I expect God to, to move on from Mordecai and Esther because they've failed and compromised. And yet that doesn't happen. What we see here is the complete opposite, especially in verses 9, 15, and 17. I have these on the screen behind me. What happens to Esther as she, as she moves forward and makes these choices? Verse 9, and the young woman, that being Esther, pleased him. And what happened? Won his favor. Verse 15, now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. Verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won what? Grace and favor. The, these little verses here are almost identical to the verses of Daniel, as Daniel and his friends remained faithful to God. The only thing missing is the word God. God's silent in the book of Esther. Here, here's why we need to see this. This is shocking good news for us, Anchor Church. This is really good news for us. See, God places his favor on unfaithful people and works through them to see his purposes and his plans move forward. What we see in the book of Esther is God places his favor on unfaithful people and works through them to see his plans and or purposes and plans move forward. And this is good news to you and I because what? Well, we are just like Esther and Mordecai. We are not the heroes of the story. We are the ones who fail over and over again. We are the ones who, as we face the tension of culture and being the bad guys, will compromise our faith. We are the ones who, instead of speaking up and proclaiming the, the name of God and who God is to the world around us, will shrink back and hide in the shadows. We are the ones who, instead of remaining holy, choose to walk in sin. We are the compromised ones. Over and over again, you and I compromise. Maybe that's your story here this morning. Maybe you come here and your story is one of, of hidden sin. You, you might come here and you have a smile on your face. You have some timbits. You're a happy person. You put your hands up in worship. But the reality is in the depths of your heart, you feel shame and regret and pain. For the past weeks or months or years, you've walked in, in open sin in your life. And you come here this morning and, and the thought in your mind is God would never want me or even think about working in me or through me. Or, or maybe you come here this morning and you've had opportunity upon opportunity the past month to share the gospel with people around you. You've had opportunities to be associated with God's people. And as those opportunities have come forward, you've actually chickened out, Right? You said, I know the cost if I, if I proclaim I'm a follower of Jesus. I know the cost if I stand up for my orthodox belief and faith and the cost is too great, so I'm going to stand in the shadows. And you come here this morning and there's shame and regret with that. As you read through the story of Esther this morning, you're like, dang it, I'm an Esther. Dang it, I'm like Mordecai. 
I failed. I failed. And the thought you have is, how could God ever work through me? Is God done with me? Have I blown it to the point where there's no return when it comes to God and his purposes? See, here, here's why this story, along with a number of stories in the Bible, are so important. See, our sin, our lack of courage, our compromise, it doesn't mean that God is done with us. It doesn't mean that God is done with us. Listen, if our imperfections disqualify us from being used by God, then the whole Bible would be pretty short. All right, the Bible will be very short. There's one perfect person in the Bible, and that's Jesus. The rest of the people throughout the pages of Scripture are compromised people, imperfect. They are men and women who are flawed, who are compromised, even at times outright disobedient to God. Story after story, person after person. We could go through the pages of scripture and you see it time and time again. Jesus was the perfect servant of God. You and I are not. Esther and Mordecai are not. Daniel and his friends, as great as they were, were still flawed men. There's one perfect person and it's Jesus. And it's Jesus who comes and he covers our sins. He redeems us in our failings in our compromise, in our brokenness. Jesus qualifies the bruised and the broken, the imperfect before God. God works his plans and purposes through broken, sinful, compromised people. Now I, I say that, and what I know is happening in some of your ears right now is the yeah buts. Satan's coming, and he's speaking, and he's whispering in your mind, in your head, yeah, but if Luke knew what you're doing, he wouldn't say that. Yeah, for the person next to you, that might be true, but for you, not even close. Satan's going to do that time and time again. He'll come along and just try to disqualify you, disqualify you, disqualify you. Listen, if that's happening right, right now, I want to point you to the words of, of the great Martin Luther. Luther was one of the great reformers of our faith. He was a man who was outspoken and did a lot of change, but he was also a very broken guy. He was far from perfect. He was a racist. He did a lot of evil things. And Satan came to him often. In his writings, he talks about how Satan came and visits, visits him and would condemn him time and time again. And this is a, his advice to us this morning. If Satan's whispering in your ear this morning, yeah, buts, listen to Luther's advice to us. He says this, you should tell the devil just by telling me that I'm a miserable, great sinner, you're placing a sword, a weapon in my hand with which I can device, decisively overcome you. Yea, with your own weapon, I can kill you and floor you. For if you tell me that I'm a poor sinner, I, on the other hand, can tell you that Christ died for sinners and, this, and, and is their intercessor. You remind me of the boundless, great fullness and benefactual benefiction of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him, I direct you. You may accuse and condemn him, let me rest in peace, for on his shoulders, not mine, lie all my sins. On his shoulders, not mine, lie all my sins. Whatever Satan is bringing into your life right now, whatever he's whispering to you, saying you're disqualified, you're disqualified, you just gotta tell him, hey, the sins aren't on my shoulders anymore. They're on Jesus. Your past sins, your present sins, your future sins, your compromise, do not disqualify you from God because Jesus has dealt with your sins. He has taken them to the cross and you bear them no more. You can be assured that your sins have been dealt with and forgiven because of Jesus' work for you, Anchor Church. Here's the thing about God's work in this world. Esther and Mordecai are deeply flawed people who screw up in big ways. And as they screw up, God works through their story. God doesn't, doesn't promote their sin. He doesn't, can, or doesn't champion their sin. He isn't cheering them on. But through the shadows of their story and their, and their, and their sin and their wickedness and their bad choices, he is working out his plans and his purposes. Our, our sins cannot stump God. Our failures cannot stump God from moving forward. God's grace is powerful enough. I think the story of Peter is a good place to end this morning. 
If you're, if you're still having yeah buts in your mind, let's, let's go to the story of Peter. Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, one of Jesus' closest disciples. The, the man who loved Jesus, who walked with Jesus, who saw the miracles. He even walked on water for a little bit, just a little bit. As, as Jesus in, as, is in the upper room with his disciples before his death, Jesus lets them know that one of these disciples is going to uh, turn him over to the authorities to, to betray him. And Peter's reaction, I will never leave you, Jesus. What a cocky guy, eh? He must have been American, right? It just sounds so American. I will never betray you, Jesus. I would never walk on you. I am with you to the grave, Jesus. Don't you worry. And Jesus' words to Peter is like, bro, you're going to betray me. Three times. Peter fights it, but Jesus gets arrested. He stands before trial, and Peter's there watching from afar. Three times, Peter denies Jesus. He even invokes a curse onto himself. And the last time Peter denies Jesus, Jesus is close enough to see him, to make eye contact with him. I would assume he's close enough to hear him. Could you imagine that moment being Peter, compromising in the tension of that moment and then having Jesus look at you in the face? And Peter leaves that moment just crushed. I'm sure as Peter left that moment, he thought this is it. There's no way Jesus would want anything to do with me. Jesus dies. He rises again. He's barbecuing on the beach. And Peter comes to him. I'm sure Peter's thinking like, man, I'm going to get chewed up by Jesus. He's going to tell me to get lost. He's going to tell me like, get out of here. Like, what kind of friend are you? You betrayed me three times. You even called a curse down upon yourself because you didn't want to be associated with me. What, what? Get out of here, Peter. I'm sure that's what Peter was thinking. And yet Jesus comes to Peter and three times he asks him, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And then Jesus says, go and feed my sheep. If the man who denied Jesus three times is not disqualified from going out and seeing God's purpose and plan move forward, if God can still work through Peter, God can work through us. No matter where you've been or what you've done, you cannot you cannot forfeit God's plans and purposes in this world. The Puritans remind us famously, they say this, there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. There is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. And that's good news for us. Because as we face the tension of this world, as we face the tension of being bad guys, we will fail time and time again. Yet God's plan and purposes will move forward through broken messed up, compromised people like you and me. God's mercy is more. It will not run dry. It will not run out. And that's what he offers us this morning. If you're here and this is your first time at church, you can know no matter where you've been, what you've done, God will meet you with his mercy. He will not turn away from you. He will not walk away from you. He loves and pursues you to the point of death on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. His mercy is more. If you're here this morning and you're just bogged down in sin, bogged down in compromise, the good news of the gospel is Jesus meets you where you're at and his mercy will not run out. And we celebrate that here at Anchor Church every week as we take communion. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, we want to invite you in just a couple minutes to come up and dip the bread in the juice of the wine and remember the endless supply of Jesus' love and mercy for you through the cross. Be reminded that his blood was shed for your sins. They are wiped clean. You are cleansed because of his blood spilt for you. His body broken so that you can be made right with God once and for all. Not because of what you do or what you've done, but because of Jesus' work on the cross for you. That is the good news of the gospel and that's what we're gonna celebrate this morning.